On Contact with Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges. Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss resistance movements with a historian, Adam Hochschild. These were obviously people who felt life wasn't worth living otherwise. If you're faced with an advancing fascist army that's trying to take over your homeland and you don't resist it, you couldn't live with yourself. Uncon neoliberalism is patriotism. Truth, Truth is not a attack. Socialist ideals, false states, class war, corporate arbitrage, the utopian ideology of neoliberalism, a revolt on mass. Uncon, 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 Chris Hedges. Those that attempt to change history, from anti-fascist volunteers in the Spanish Civil War to socialists who struggle to halt the slaughter during World War I, hold fast to moral imperatives. They are dismissed as idealists by those who do not see beyond the limits of the practical, no matter how evil the world around them has become. Sometimes these rebels succeed. Most often, throughout history, they do not. These rebels often vanish in the mists of history, where they are forgotten or their names and deeds are erased. They have within them a curious mixture of gloom and hope, defiance and resignation, and an understanding of the meaning and ultimate absurdity of human existence. They know the enormity of what they face. They know the cost may well be their own lives. They grasp, as Václav Havel wrote, that hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. Anya Parampel looks at the Spanish Civil War and how it attracted idealists from the United States and Europe who sought to battle fascism. Have you heard of the Civil War in which thousands of Americans volunteered to fight? That's right, without any direction from their government between the years 1936 and 1938, nearly 3,000 Americans flocked to serve in the Spanish Civil War. Historians estimate 35,000 foreign fighters served in the war, mostly with little military experience and from neighboring European countries. So why was such a cadre of international fighters attracted to serve in a civil conflict? The answer is simple. It's because the Spanish Civil War was not so much about controlling Spain's borders and more about a fight against fascism. In the 1930s, Germany and Italy were in the hands of maniacal strongmen Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. But in Spain, a left-wing government remained in power until 1936, when the right-wing nationalists led by General Francisco Franco tried to take over the country with military support from the Nazis and Mussolini. So for many, the war in Spain was a battle between the Republicans and democracy on one side and the nationalists and fascism on the other. Thus, those concerned with crushing the rise of fascism worldwide flocked to Spain. A young Englishman named George Orwell traveled to Spain to join the Republican militias in 1936. He would go on to become one of the most famous writers of his generation. In his first-hand account of his experience in Spain, homage to Catalonia, he summed up the hope of the war succinctly. If you had asked me why I had joined the militia, I should have answered to fight against fascism. And if you had asked me what I was fighting for, I should have answered common decency. Ultimately, after three years of fighting, the nationalists emerged victorious, paving the way for a decades-long fascist dictatorship under Franco. But the thousands who died fighting, including the 750 Americans, did not die for any nation, but rather for the cause of a better tomorrow. Thank you, Anya. The struggle of the rebel to make a better world is bitter, lonely, and often doomed. Few writers have done a better job of chronicling the rebels in history who fought slavery, the folly of war, and the battle against fascism than Adam Hochschild. He's the author of eight books, including King Leopold's Ghost. His latest book, Spain in Our Hearts, looks at Americans who served in the Spanish Civil War. It was released this year. Thank you, Adam. I love your work. They depress me because I finish one of your books and then wish I'd written it. So you ruined several weeks of my life. Um, but one of the things I love is that you tell the story of so many 
figures who rise up against insurmountable odds. In the case of the anti-war resistors in World War I, in the case of those who went to Spain in the newest book to fight Franco's fascism, well, we should say Italian and German fascism since they were the backbone of Franco's army. Not only do they know that the odds are against them, but they often reach a point where they know it's doomed. What is it that you find about these particular rebels that, you, that, that fascinates you? Well, I love to write about times and places where people felt they were engaged in a tremendously important moral or political struggle of some sort. Whether that struggle was against uh, slavery in the Atlantic world, against Stalinism in Russia, against apartheid in South Africa, colonialism in the Congo, fascism in Spain. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, that fascinate me that, uh, you know, I want to know what does it feel like to be engaged in that kind of struggle, to be willing to risk your life, which a lot of these people did? Let's talk about some of the figures you highlight in your books. Let's start with King Leopold's ghost. Um, I believe he's Nigerian, Hazika Andrew Shanu. He was uh, born in what today is Nigeria, was then a, a British colony in the Niger Delta. Uh, worked, uh, moved then to the Congo, which was a private colony of King Leopold II of Belgium. Uh, and, and let's just back up there by saying that, um, and this is from King Leopold's ghost, the King of Belgium, in the name of Western civilization, enlightenment, and ending slavery, perpetuated one of the worst genocides um, in history, right? Ab absolutely. He took over this vast territory in the, the center of Africa, roughly the same boundaries that the Democratic Republic of Congo has today. And for 23 years, it was his personal, privately owned uh, Farm, possession right. from 1885 to 1908. Uh, made a huge fortune worth well over a billion dollars in today's American dollars, mainly from turning the indigenous population into a slave labor force to gather wild rubber, which was in, enormously lucrative. Uh, Shenu, whom you mentioned, uh, was working there, uh, uh, had various posts, lower down posts in the colonial administration, uh, smuggled information, government documents and so on, to a remarkable journalist in England, Edmund Dean Morell, who was engaged in crusading against uh, King Leopold. Now, am I, am I right in remembering that Morell was tipped off to this by being at the port That's and right. watching the ships leave filled with arms and coming back filled with rubber. Is exactly that right? Exactly <laughs> right. That's what turned Morell into a muckraking journalist and really the, the great investigative journalist in Britain in his age. Uh, but he was working in England, so he was relatively safe. Uh, Shenu was working in Africa. And when he was discovered by King Leopold's regime as the source of some of these documents that Morel had published, he was essentially hounded to death. They didn't dare kill him outright because he was a British subject, but he had a couple of small businesses. Uh, instructions were given that no employees of Leopold's colonial administration were to shop there. He went bankrupt and he committed suicide. So here's somebody largely forgotten today. Right. Very little is known about him, but he was willing to risk his life to bring news of injustice uh, to the outside world in hopes that something could be done about it. In Origins of Totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt writes that it's not those who say this shouldn't be done or this oughtn't to be done. It's those who say, I can't. And that seems to me to embody many of the figures you focus on. Yeah. People who say, I won't be part of this regime. Even I, at the cost of my life. Yeah. Those are the people I like to write about. In the, the First World War, To End All Wars, uh, that book is about resistors against the madness of the First World War, uh, an event that was certainly worth resisting. Not only did it kill 15 or 20 million people outright, but it remade the world for the worse in every conceivable way. We can't imagine the Second World War without the first. Uh, and a lot of people at the time sensed that this was going to be so and refused to fight. I focused on England because there were more people there who 
were in part of an organized resistance movement than there were in any other country. Um, and if we want to talk about one particular person, uh, there's a guy named Bert Brockelsby. This is part of the 49 war, anti-war resistors who were imprisoned and then sent to France. That's right. This was uh, the f one of the... F Britain actually didn't have a draft until early 1916, so there were no draft refusers up until that point. Suddenly, spring of 1916, they have a draft, and there are a number of people who, for reasons of conscience, both political and religious, uh, and these often overlapped, wouldn't go. Uh, they were arrested. The British government hadn't yet figured out how to, how to deal with them. Uh, there was a first batch of them, 49 of these men, who said, we will not go. They were forcibly conscripted into the British Army, refused to obey orders, uh, and they were put on a train, shipped to the port of Southampton, and sent to the war zone. And they were told that if you continue to refuse orders here, you're in a war zone, the penalty is death. Uh, they didn't know what they were in for. They were held in barracks. They continued to refuse all orders. Uh, what they also didn't know was that as their train, the prison train taking them to Southampton had been going through London, uh, someone had tossed out of a window a note with the name of an organization supporting conscientious objectors saying, help, you know, there are 49 of us were being uh, forcibly transported uh, to the front. Uh, and a railway track worker had found this and gotten it to its destination. So there were people desperately lobbying the British government to save, save their lives. Uh, when they got to France, they were held in some old stables uh, at the port of now, Boulogne. Am I right that they were threatened with execution? They were threatened. They were told, if you continue to refuse to right. obey orders, you will be shot. Uh, this man I mentioned, Bert Brocklesby, who was a school teacher, managed to smuggle a message out to their supporters in England by crossing words and letters off on a pre-printed postcard that was something all soldiers were allowed to send filled with innocuous messages, I'm doing fine, you know, send me chocolate and clothes or whatever. He managed to cross out letters to, to spell out the words, we are in Boulogne. So their supporters knew where they were. Uh, and were able to further mobilize help in England. They continued to refuse to obey orders. And finally, enough, and they were held under horrible conditions, fed starvation rations. Finally, enough pressure was put in England that they were brought home. And they never gave in, these 49 guys, even though they knew it was, they faced a sentence of death. We're going to stop there for a second. We'll return after a short break with author and journalist Adam Hochschild. What politicians do is something we don't do. They put themselves on the line and they get accepted or rejected. So when you want to be president, what would you want to be? What would someone want to be president? What's it like to be president? What's it like when the phone rings at three in the morning? Can't be a good call. I'm interested always in the whys and the hows. And Q Larry, question the Earlier today, President Obama Senate Republicans have previously stated that the president responsible for poisoning people in Flint. There is always hope. That's what goes Trump on in politics. Trump is making a lot of noise. What are women supposed to do? Here's something else we know. The deal between the U.S. Lawyers and Cuba. Lawyers at the ACLU have already some degree of loss in business. It's a huge difference. Following the announcement, oil prices are going to be 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 going
This is an incredibly tense situation. Welcome back. Let's continue our conversation with author of Spain in Our Hearts, Adam Hochschild. So we told this story about the war resistors. Uh, I just want to bring up one other figure from your book on Spain and then broaden this discussion. And this is Bob Merriman, uh, who ends up becoming quite a high-ranking figure on the side of the Republican government, uh, brilliant academic. Uh, and there's a moment in the book where he knows the Republican government is going to lose the war to the fascists. He's married to a woman he loves very much, who is in Spain with him. He hands over his diaries. He tells her that if he's killed, she should remarry. And he goes back. Maybe you can talk a little bit about him as a figure. Uh, he was somebody I felt uh, oddly close to for an unexpected reason. Uh, when I was researching the book, trying to figure out through which characters am I going to tell this story of the 2,800 Americans who voluntarily went to the Spanish 750 of whom were killed. That's right. A higher death rate than the U.S. military suffered in either of the world wars. Um, who was I going to choose? So I stumbled on this couple, Bob and Marion Merriman. They both went to Spain. And Bob had been a graduate student at Berkeley in the early 1930s. And in going through their letters, I almost fell off my chair when I realized that when he was a grad student at Berkeley, uh, they lived a couple of blocks away from where I do today. And every time I walk from my house to the Graduate School of Journalism where I teach a class, I walk past the building where they live. So I felt a certain connection uh, to this man and to his wife. And she survived, wrote a book. He kept a diary, which she brought home from Spain. There are a lot of letters between them. And uh, because he was well known for his courage and leadership, uh, many correspondents interviewed him. So we have some sense of what his life w was like. Uh, he fought on, even as you say, when it was clear in the later months of the war that the Spanish Republic was not likely uh, to survive. But like the other Americans who went to Spain, he was determined to fight fascism. This was the place in the world where the crucial battle seemed to be. And, and you point out a high percentage were Jewish, Jewish working class. That's right, something that barely exists in this country any, anymore. Um, probably uh, a third to a half of the Americans who went to Spain were Jewish. Uh, a great many of them were labor union members. A great many of them came from uh, the New York area. But really, the, those American volunteers came from all over the country, 46 of what was then 48 states. Uh, they included the son of a former governor of Ohio, the son of a former mayor of Los Angeles, um, lumberjacks, uh, stevedores, school teachers, all kinds of occupations. Um, the largest number of Americans were killed during a disastrous retreat in the spring of uh, 1938, March 1938, when General Franco and his Spanish nationalists, heavily supported by Mussolini's troops, Hitler's aircraft and I didn't and quite tanks. realize how heavily supported. I mean, I think you said, what, 80,000? Mussolini had 80,000 ground troops in Spain. Hundreds of planes. Yeah. Hundreds. The con I mean, many of them flown by German pilots. Most of them flown by German Condor, pilots. Condor, the Condor Legion, of course. Right. And uh, Italian aircraft as well. Uh, and in uh, March 1938, Franco launched the biggest offensive of the war, which was designed to cut the Spanish Republic into two pieces, which it did. Uh, the American volunteer units were in the forefront of the Republican Army, taking the brunt of that assault. Uh, hundreds of guys uh, were, were killed, wounded, captured. Uh, and, and usually, ex always executed, right? Almost, almost always. always executed. Right. Almost always executed if they were, if they were captured. Uh, Bob Merriman was last seen alive 
on August 2nd, uh, 1938, leading a group of American, Spanish, and other international volunteers uh, trying to flee this, this advance. We know that they reached a particular hilltop, uh, hoping to cross a valley in front of them, and if they could get over a mountain range on the other side, they knew they would be safe and in Republican territory. But when they reached this hilltop at dawn on that day, they saw that the valley was full of fascist troops, uh, as well as those that were coming up behind them. They knew they were surrounded. They split into smaller groups uh, to try to slip across, some during the day, some during the night. Most of them didn't make it. That's where he was last seen alive. Uh, his wife, Marion, never knew exactly how or when that day or the next day or whatever he, he was killed. Was he, did he die in combat? Was he captured and then shot? She never knew. Uh, nearly 50 years later, she received a letter from a Spanish soldier who said, uh, I knew your husband, I admired him, I served with him, I had to keep my head down all the years of the dictatorship, but now I can write and tell you I was with him when he died, and here's where it was. Now, 50 years later, everybody's, anybody's memory is a little bit shaky. There's some other people who say, no, it wasn't at this spot, it was a few miles away. But when I was writing my book, I went to that hilltop in Spain, uh, looked at the valley, tried to imagine how it looked uh, at this moment some 80 years before. Uh, and it's always haunting, and you've probably had the same experience yourself. You go to the site of something that was a terrible battle, and it's a beautiful scene Right, well, I just today. came from Auschwitz, which yeah. is pristine and the grass is cut. Yeah, right, right. and at this hilltop in Spain, you know, there are rolling fields, right. vineyards, olive groves, uh, little villages with red terracotta roofs. But you knew on this day at, at dawn many years before, um, uh, it was a grim scene. It was full of Italian tanks, Franco's cavalry, uh, spotter aircraft circling overhead. These, these men knew they were trapped. Why should we resist in the face of inevitable defeat? I mean, that's something you've explored in many of the characters you write about. You have that chapter at the end, to end all wars. You know, you talk about the military cemeteries, and you said, you know, if there was a cemetery for all those people, why? Why should we do that? Well, I feel um, sort of out of my depth in saying this because I've never lived in a situation where I was faced with the prospect of living under a fascist dictatorship. Uh, happily, I've never well, faced... Well, you may get your chance. <laughs> <laughs> I may. That may happen. Uh, but I've, so I've never faced those difficult life and death choices myself. But I admire the people who have faced them this way, and I can only say from having studied them and tried to write about them that these were obviously people who felt life wasn't worth living otherwise. If you're faced with an advancing fascist army that's trying to take over your homeland and you don't resist it, you couldn't live with yourself. And the extraordinary thing to me about the Americans who went to Spain and that I wrote about in Spain in our hearts is that these were people who made this kind of sacrifice for a country that was not their own, a country that uh, almost none of them had ever been to before. Although I think many of them understood that this was the first battle of fascism, and I think this is correct, that if this is, of course, what drew many of the Jewish yeah. members of the, uh, the Lincoln Brigade, and they were right. They were absolutely right, because after all, this was the only place in the world in 1937, 1938, that Americans in uniform were being bombed by Nazi pilots several years before we entered World War II. Is it also, and I think you also allude to this in your book, you talk about how you, when you were a young reporter, there were veterans from the Spanish Civil War in the newsroom. You talk about the anti-war protests where members of the Lincoln Brigade would appear. And then uh, I remember them visiting in Nicaragua mm -hmm. uh, in the Contra War. And they have, because of that resistance, even though, of course, the war was lost to Franco, 
they impart, and I think you, you feel this yourself, a kind of moral force. They do, and they, they did. And I think, as with so many struggles, in a way, in the long run, they won their war. Spain is a democracy today. Uh, it has its problems, but it's a democracy, and it's a pretty peaceful one. Uh, and this is the kind of, kind of Spain they were fighting for. And you walk through the streets of Barcelona today, and you see people from all over Europe who've come to live there. Um, sometimes you don't win the struggle in the first battle. Sometimes it does take a long time, but that dictatorship eventually did, did fall, and it's very moving in Spain today to find a lot of Spaniards trying to recover the legacy of the Civil War, to understand... Well, because Franco erased huge parts of their own history. He certainly did. And, and you've seen this in Eastern Europe. Yes. Where, where you know, uh, I mean, I, I agree with you, although I think it's counterintuitive that there are moments where not only is defeat likely, but finally defeat is certain. And yet, if we don't resist, something within us, and I speak as a collective, dies. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's true. Um, and I admire people who found themselves in these circumstances and have kept on fighting, often at enormous risk to themselves. Well, there's a great line. I can't remember who said it. You know, one, you can be defeated, but you should never surrender. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of embodies, I think, you know, what Auden calls that ironic point of light that flashes out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I, composed like them of Eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. And it's that affirming flame, even if it is snuffed out at a particular moment, which lights the flame of those who follow. Um, I went to El Salvador because of George Orwell, because I wanted to fight fascism, and that was as close as my generation could come. Mm -hmm. I went because of homage to Catalonia, mm -hmm. a book you, you know, quote from in your book. And, and I think that that is the power of your work, that these people bear moral witness, and even in the face of defeat, they are kind of signposts for the rest of us and impart a kind of spiritual power uh, which allows us to know where we came from and, and to resist. You're absolutely right. And, you know, if I can help by introducing the activists of today to some of their political forebears, uh, I'll be very grateful. Well, you've done that, and, and you've done it brilliantly in several books, which you know, are finally deeply comforting because um, you feel you're not alone. That's good to hear. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> that was journalist and author of Spain in Our Hearts, Adam Hochschild. I do not know if we can build a better society. I do not even know if we will survive as a species. But I know these corporate forces have us by the throat and they have my children by the throat. I do not fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. And this is a fight that in the face of the overwhelming forces against us requires us to find in acts of rebellion, the embers of life, an intrinsic meaning that lies outside the certainty of success. It is at once to grasp reality and then refuse to allow this reality to paralyze us. It is, and I say this to people of all creeds or no creeds, to make an absurd leap of faith, to believe, despite all empirical evidence around us, that the good always draws to it the good, that the fight for life always goes somewhere we do not know where, the Buddhists call it karma. And in these acts, we sustain our belief in a better world, even if we cannot see one emerging around us. Thank you for watching. You can find us on rt.com slash oncontact. Until next week.